Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest in the Parkinson's Society Southwestern Ontario webinar series. Uh, I'm your host, Mark. I am the Community Development Coordinator up in Grey Bruce um, on the shore of, shores of beautiful Lake Huron, where for the today it seems to be sunny. I uh, hope it's been sunny in your neighborhood as well. We've got a great speaker today, and uh, I'm really, really excited to, to welcome Carrie. I'll read her bio just shortly, but I do want to remind us of a couple things. Um, first of all, questions, which I know we're going to have. Everybody loves to ask the questions, and we have a very responsive speaker today. Um, so questions can be posed in the question and answer box or in the um, chat box, and we will ask them, we will bring them to Carrie at the end of the session. Um, so in approximately 45 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, so feel free to ask those questions and um, I'll make sure we, we don't duplicate or we try not to duplicate. Um, also, we have some exciting webinars planned in the months ahead. Um, so please watch your emails and join us on the Parkinson Society Southwestern Ontario website for registration details. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker today. So Carrie King's from London, Ontario. She graduated in 2010 from Western University's Speech Language Pathology Master's Program. Her clinical experience spans many ages and settings. And in 2015, she began her full service private practice, Connect Speech Therapy, working part-time on a wide variety of ages and needs, including initiating the Louder Clearer Group which is now offered through the Parkinson Society of Southwestern Ontario. Other than her work as a speech language therapist, she or pathologist, sorry, uh, she's the proud mother to four children. She enjoys soccer and the outdoors and remains an active volunteer within her church and community. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Carrie King presenting communication strategies for care partners. Thank you uh, so much. This uh, is a pleasure to be able to join everyone here. And I'm just gonna get my screen started and, and showing for you guys. And give me one second, we gotta love technology here. <laughs> we always have technology, technology right. issues. <laughs> there we go. So can we see that okay there? Perfect. Excellent. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just, share my webcam is that still possible here we go just to say hello so you can put a face to the voice here we are so working from home as many of us are um, and so I will be turning off my camera uh, to continue with the presentation but just wanted to say hello um, make it a little bit more personal here so here we go All right, and so what I'd like to uh, just say here is, as, um, I, as was part of the introduction, the topic that we're covering today will be um, you know, helping with communication strategies for those of you who are here who are care partners. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. And if I don't get to your questions or if you come up with a question after today, I want to make sure that I mention that you're welcome to email or contact me personally. Um, we can share the information here, and actually you see it on my, my slide here. Um, my contact, uh, you can find it on the website, or of course you can give me a call at that number if you have any questions or concerns or anything like that that you'd like to chat with a speech pathologist about. And so as this says here, as and as I was introduced, um, speech therapist, I've been doing this for a decade pretty much this year. Um, and you know, with regards to my practice and, and where I work, I do work primarily with adults, um, teenagers as well, older adults included in that, who have a number of difficulties. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with speech language pathology, just to give a quick introduction of that, we're basically the neck and up professionals. So anything that's a concern regarding you know, anywhere the neck and up region. So really, you know, your throat, you think, if you think what's in your throat, you have to swallow, you have your voice. And so if you have issues there, 
you may have to go to a doctor if it's a surgery or something like that. But if it's rehab or something wrong with how it's functioning and working, usually a speech pathologist is involved for that. As well, of course, we have our mouth and, that, and that's, you know, regarding chewing or speech, things along those lines, again, within our scope. And then, of course, we have the brain side of it. And so brain, um, the brain's involvement, as far as Parkinson's goes, I'm going to assume that many of you have a basic um, idea of that, but I will just touch on that a little bit. But basically, as a speech pathologist, the reason why a speech pathologist is even involved in this is because we know that the brain obviously is involved for communication. It's the control center for communication, swallowing, for the things that need to happen for you to produce your voice. And so we ultimately have training as well in how the brain's role is involved in different diseases, including things like Parkinson's. So most people think that speech pathologists are just for lisps or stutters or children, but no, in fact, we do work with a wide range of issues in all ages. So we'll just proceed um, as we go here. Whoopsie, whoops. Am I showing my cam again? I think so. There we go. So as we know, um, and just to recap, Parkinson's is a slowly progressive, um, so it changes over time gradually. And so we know that it's um, as a result of the gener degeneration of dopamine in the brain, the areas of the brain that are responsible for that. And so one thing that I really want to emphasize here is when you think about the issues that we're going to be talking about and how you as communication partners or, or um, care partners um, can help, rem remembering that there's a reduction in perception. And so the ability to perceive if you're speaking loud enough, the ability to perceive if you're walking and taking the right amount of steps, the ability to perceive the bigness of your movements is off. And so, or the bigness, you know, the, the, the extent of, of how um, you're moving is off for people who have Parkinson's. And that's a really basic explanation, but it's to say that there's a mismatch between what they're doing and what they're perceiving they are doing. And so if we can remember that, if we can think to ourselves, okay, for example, if their voice, if they're not speaking loud enough, is it that they don't know how, or they don't want to, are they being lazy? Are they trying to annoy me or frustrate me? And, and that sort of those sorts of feelings that can really come for some people. Or is it they think they're being loud enough, but they aren't, their perception is off. So that's a really important part. And again, that's, that's the brain's role in that. Um, and so we have here some big words, bradykinesia, so that the um, idea that movements are slower. And as you see here, this can affect things like speech because speech requires movements of muscles, very, very fine movements, your tongue being one of them. Handwriting, which many of you probably have observed changing um, due to this change in movement, and then of course reduced facial expressions. And then hypokinetic dysarthria is a fancy way to basically say that there's this reduction, there's a low amount of movement in how the muscles in the brain are communicating. And so this can certainly affect the muscles that are needed for speech and swallowing. So it's no surprise then that based on research, about 90%, so 89% of people based on research um, will have some speech and voice symptoms as a result of Parkinson's disease. So quite the majority. So speech symptoms, oops, sorry, speech symptoms, um, and, and just this may be um, relevant for some of you, and for some of you, maybe you haven't seen these changes yet in your care, in your um, partner. Speech symptoms could include things like quiet voice, really, really reduced soft voice, irregular, slow, or fast rate of speech. So it seems like it's slow and then it speeds up, there are these spurts and then it's slow again, or just generally slower or generally faster. You may, they may have difficulty with starting talking. There may be sort of a stutter that some people start to notice. Inappropriate pauses where it doesn't seem to quite sound right, a breath, a breathy or flat, shaky voice, those are all parts of um, speaking that we would help with as speech pathologists that, that we may see in people who have Parkinson's. Respiration, so breathing issues and reduction in that. Again, if you think anything to do with muscles, we need muscles in our rib cage and the, the thorax area there to expand and for us to take a big breath. And I'd like to tell people, breathing is like putting gas in the tank. You have to have air in your lungs to power your voice and to power speech. And so if we just recognize that even the ability to take a big breath might be reduced, which then affects what the output is, is our voice, that is something that can be a problem. 
and the voice production is the actual phonation, the actual ability for the vocal folds to move. Articulation, which is the speech sounds that need to be said and how clearly they are said. Other symptoms that may be associated, and these are all within the scope of speech pathology, which is why I'm mentioning these um, swallowing problems, so dysphagia is a fancy word for that, and things that you may notice are unexplained weight loss, if there's a lot of pooling in the mouth of saliva or food, um, you know, a lot of dripping, things like that, coughing, choking, voice changes after eating, so that means that the food or the drinks went down the wrong way towards the vocal folds and the trachea, the air um, the air tube there, um, pneumonia, recurrent pneumonia, so things are getting into the lungs via um, our trachea, and drooling as well, I don't think I mentioned that here, but drooling is also something that can be treated or worked with um, from the speech pathology's end of things, if we think about the mouth and the muscles. Difficulty with writing, and, and that's progressive usually, and there's a certain um, way that it looks, cognitive changes, so attention, memory, um, being able to hold on to information or multitask or those sorts of things, um, and then decrease in facial expressions as I mentioned. So that's an overview and it's it's quite detailed, but that's an overview and again some of you may have noticed some of these in your partners with um, Parkinson's disease and some of you may not have noticed some of those. So this is an example, this voice handicap index is an example of a questionnaire, and these are just a few select questions, that someone with Parkinson's disease may complete when they come and see a speech pathologist. And this gives us an idea of how, for example, their voice changes, which is a big one for a lot of people, that's the one that I'll spend some time on, voice and speech, um, how some of their voice changes are affecting them. And again, the voice being the quality of the voice, the loudness of the voice, their ability to say words precisely is more so speech, but all of their output when communicating. And so this voice handicap index is a nice um, sort of questionnaire. And so it goes through different areas. So functional being, you know, how does it impact your ability to function? Your These changes in your voice or your speech, how does it impact your ability to function? And you see some examples here, such as my family can't hear me. I don't use the phone as much. It restricts my options for going out with, you know, socializing or, or having conversations personally. So personal and social life. So those are the functional Im impacts for some people. Physically, some people may feel like they run out of air or that their voice varies too much throughout the day or they, they, have a, they need to use a lot of effort to speak. So those are the actual physical, the actual physical task of speaking. And then emotionally for some people, they do find that with their voice issues, they might feel tense or uptight about talking. They may feel withdrawn. Um, they may find that other people don't understand them. That's very common. Or just annoyed or frustrated with having to repeat themselves, whether that be you as their care partners or friends or strangers at the store. It can be frustrating depending on their, their perspective on it and their experience with communicating. So that's just an example of how we might gather some of the issues and, and personalize what's going on. And so you as caregivers, certainly there are trends or patterns when speaking with caregivers that I work with who are um, either married to or friends with or taking care of someone with Parkinson's disease, helping to care for them. And so some people do say that they really can't hear them. And so, of course, we want to make sure that everyone's hearing is okay. If, if, you know, if we rule that out, if we say that your hearing is okay, the audiologist told you your hearing's great, so it's not you, because sometimes it can feel that way, or sometimes that's what people think. Um, but we certainly want to make sure that, that hearing's okay. And so the caregivers are concerned, I'm not understanding or hearing them. Am I losing my hearing, right? Um, my partner doesn't want to talk as much as, the, as, as we may find out during the assessment, or as the, the caregiver may share with us. They're just withdrawn. Their personality has changed. Um, they don't want to attend as many social outings or lunches, and that can really impact couples um, or partners. Um, they're clearing their throat a lot more often. Their voice just sounds a little bit breathy or rougher, um, or that they think that you, the caregiver, needs the hearing aid, which I mentioned. And so we have some basics uh, here as far as improving communication, which is what we're here to talk about today. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there are all these different sorts of changes that affect Parkinson's, uh, people with Parkinson's disease. And so, Speaking specifically to the idea of improving communication, what are the things that you can do at home when or when you're out and about or when you're planning, you know, an outing? I know these days a lot of things are restricted, but if you are planning any sort of outing, um, what can you be thinking of to make it an enjoyable and 
fulfilling experience because communication is everywhere. We do communication all the time. It's, it's something that we take for granted until it's gone or until it's affected. And so when it's affected, people often then withdraw, withdraw and there becomes a cycle of withdrawing and not feeling confident or not wanting to speak. And then that can ultimately impact relationships or that person's well-being, which we don't want. So communication really is important to life and to connection and to human connection. And it's such an important fundamental thing, but um, you know, often we don't really address it as we should. And so as you all are here today, I wanted to show you these basics to say, here are things that you can do at home to address this really important um, aspect to your, your relationship with this person and to their well-being. So when communicating, some basics you want to do, and I'll repeat some of this because they are very important, but this is a nice overview for any of you who are taking notes, et cetera. Um, basically know that we have to think about noise. We need to think about lighting, so the environment, the external environment. We need to think, am I seeing them? We listen with our eyes and with our ears, which I'll repeat again because it's really important. We don't just listen with our ears. We need to see to have the maximum benefits of communication and to reduce any in, uh, misunderstandings, okay? Being close to the person physically at appropriate distance helps us. And so often we need to, again, adjust where we physically are in space with respect to the person that we're talking with, the person with, the, with Parkinson's, um, as well as making sure it's well lit and not too bright and, and not too noisy. Having writing materials accessible, so options for communicating, alternate options for communicating if needed and pointing systems and these are for more later stages which i'll get into and you know situations that you may find this is applicable for include things like yes you might be at home and you are sitting in the kitchen as a communication partner um, and when i say that just to be clear communication partner is anyone who's communicating and in this case you are here for that reason you may also be their care partner if they need that um, but anyone that you converse with and they're close to you is essentially your communication partner and so as a communication partner, you may be sitting at home or perhaps you're planning to meet up at lunch and you may not be thinking, oh, what can I do? You may not be thinking that prior to today, you may not be thinking, what can I do to maximize their success in this communication interaction? Just like you might give someone a crutch if they broke their leg or, or a wheelchair if they needed it, you as a communication partner, you're kind of controlling the dance a little bit. You're kind of the one that's giving the person with, the, with Parkinson's the, um, the, the sort of ways to access the conversation, if you put it that way. Think of yourself as creating a ramp or building a wheelchair for them where they are not able to do it. So the dance kind of becomes, the dance of con conversing between two people, the weight of it kind of becomes on the communication partner without Parkinson's. They're the ones that kind of have to lead in this conversation dance that we now do with Parkinson's thrown in. And so you can control certain things to help increase their success and again fulfillment um, so let's say you're out at a restaurant you may now think to yourself okay maybe we'll go versus going at the busy lunch time which is our usual uh, 12 o'clock maybe we'll take an early lunch or a later lunch when the restaurant's you know much quieter and these days obviously that's different but on an average day you know can we go at a quieter time of day can we go and sit in the quiet well-lit corner of the restaurant versus being seated right by the kitchen. And maybe these are things you already think to yourself, but you can be intentional about it. And again, help with this dance of conversing. Um, certainly making sure that you aren't sitting across a huge table if you're trying to talk or, or those sorts of things. And so just recognizing that you are um, ultimately bearing a lot of the, the responsibility for successful communication, but it is very possible to do that. And so if we talk about the early stages of Parkinson's disease, um, as far as what sort of strategies might be helpful, we're gonna go through this and take our time to go through this. So again, as I said, just to re repeat, we have a, a disease that gradually gets worse over time and for everyone it looks different. We have um, the idea that it's there's a reduction in perception. So the person with Parkinson's disease doesn't always, they aren't always aware that there's not a there's a mismatch between what their output is, whether that be their walking or their speech, and what they think they're doing. So there's a mismatch and that's a, that's due to perception. There's the slowness and the reduction in movements in general. Okay. And so just keeping that in mind, what you do as a communication partner here is before you even start speaking you know, when you're entering into this, this um, exchange, this conversation, 
you want to make sure, and perhaps some of you already do this, but again, the goal is to be intentional with this and proactive, is that you're ensuring that you gain their attention. You call their name first. Are you even in the same room? Are you yelling from upstairs in the house and they're in, you know, in the kitchen? And, and so their response may not be as easily understood. So making sure that you've closed the space, as I said in the previous slides, of distance, um, but being in the same room. Establishing context, as I have there in point one, that's a big one. And so what that basically means is be before we even start talking about the doctor's appointment, by just saying, you know, Dr. Smith called and they said that the appointment's next week, but I think we got to, um, you know, uh, reschedule because yada, yada, yada. What you can do is, I want to talk about Dr. Smith. And so you both are saying, okay, that's the topic that we're talking about. By establishing the context, you proactively avoid any misunderstandings because when we have a context for what the topic is, um, what the conversation's about, we can fill in any gaps. So if you have any misunderstandings that sort of pop up, you, your brain kind of um, knowing that the context is about Dr. Smith, your brain's able to fill it in to say, oh, that's what they must have said. If I didn't catch that word, that must be what it is because this is the context of what we're talking about. Versus sometimes people just start rambling and they start telling their story or start asking their question, but they don't say this is the topic. And so just introducing the context and making sure that we're talking what we're talking about so that I can fill in any information that I might miss while the person with the with them, Parkinson's might be talking. Um, and so also thinking about driving. And so if you are seated and you are, um, you know, driving along and you have the radio going and you have the windows up perhaps, but even down, um, and you think about the noise, the ambient noise that surrounds us when we drive, sometimes we think, okay, we'll talk about it in the car. You might be thinking I have to ask this, this, them this question while we're driving on the way to the appointment or on the, on the way to our friend's house. And then it becomes perhaps a little bit of a struggle, not, maybe not for everyone, but definitely when we think about driving, we're, we're not able to have eye contact. We have this background noise. Driving and talking, especially with the radio on and that kind of thing, is not ideal. And so just even thinking, let's save any big conversations. Let's make sure that we plan ahead and time our big conversations for when we can actually control the attention um, and the distance and the noise in the background. So making sure that we have that attention and we can we can maintain eye contact, which involves the lighting and the distance as I talked about. Again, we listen best with our eyes and ears, our ears and our eyes, not just our ears. The next point here, asking questions by giving the person with Parkinson's, PWP is what that acronym stands for, giving them specific choices. So for example, we, would you like chicken, fish, or hot dogs? And that's, an, oh, that's a, a closed question or a forced choice. In this case, it's three choices, which is a little bit easier when trying to get some specific quick information. If you know that the options are very limited, you can actually list them and have them repeat the option back to you. And this is, you know, perhaps if you're asking about a medication, if you, if you were to say, what medications did you take today? And they have all these long ones that they have to list. Or you could say, did you take this and this and this and this? And so they can say a yes or no answer, for example, or they can, they can repeat back to you just to avoid any misunderstandings. Avoiding those open-ended questions such as, what do you want to eat? Which is pretty simple now, but for some people, that idea of an open-ended question and they now have to answer, they have to come up with the thought. The person with, with Parkinson's has to come up with the, the idea and say it clearly, and perhaps if, if speech or, or voice is a, tr a struggle for them, um, then there might be some miscommunication. And, and these are pretty simple examples, but you can understand how they may apply to other situations where you need to just get the specific information rather than asking the open-ended question where they have to try and answer it. And there may be a misunderstanding there. So you're compensating basically in situations like this. As I said, reducing background noise things like appliances even. So moving out of the rooms, if you have the, the dishwasher running and it's a loud one, or you have your washing machine going, or they're in the garage and you're working on something, or the car's running, just thinking what what around us is in, inter, um, intercepting or, or interfering with the signal, which is our noise, the, the sound coming out of our mouth that might be impacting my ability to hear them well, especially if I can't see their face, or for their ability to hear me well. Of course, giving the person with Parkinson's sufficient time to speak and respond. 
So, you know, again, this kind of goes back to the idea of planning and I'll be showing you a really neat acronym after we're done um, some of these, these longer points here. But that idea that when you, when you have a, a, an important conversation topic or something that's lengthier, you know, let's say you're, you're talking about your plans for your next trip, um, if that's something you're planning to do or, or had planned to do, or, you know, what we're going to be doing about the upcoming bank appointment or building that gazebo in the backyard, whatever it might be, and it's a more detailed or perhaps more um, high level, uh, longer conversation that you need to have, you want to plan these things and ensure that you don't have anything pressing to do. There's no rush. We're not having this conversation, which anyone should be thinking this way, but especially to support those who have Parkinson's disease to be able to communicate in such a way that they may need to repeat or speak slower or clarify. You're allowing that extra time to speak and respond to your questions. And so not doing timing things when you, you are have some time, some cushion around that and thinking about your general routines, et cetera. Being an active listener, and this probably can go without saying, but again, keeping it front of mind, the idea that you want to, all of the active listening strategies that some of you may or may not be familiar with, so the idea of you know, maintaining eye contact, as I said, but you're also looking at the whole person when they're talking. So not just the words coming out of their mouth, but you know the eye gaze, the gestures, what am I picking up on or what am I missing perhaps that they're not really communicating. And that's part of just successful communication to make sure that we're all on the same page. Being honest, if you do not understand the message, confirming when you do understand the message. Some of you may feel a little bit, um, you know, you may avoid, you don't want to confront your partner to say, I didn't understand that. So you kind of just go along. Um, or perhaps it, it can become an issue of contention where, you know, if you're constantly saying you didn't understand or constantly saying you didn't hear them, there can be some frustration there. But being honest, obviously, in a kind way um, and confirming when you do understand as well. So giving both that positive reinforcement that, okay, I got that. That was clear. Thank you. Um, as well as when you don't understand. Some people may, you know, benefit from deciding on a signal. And of course, you have these conversations outside of the actual um, challenging if, uh, conversation. You don't you don't decide on these things while you're having a hard time being understood or, or understanding them. Have a conversation specifically about what to do. Plan to have that conversation about what to do when I don't understand. What would you like me to do, or what would you like me to say? How can I help? Because I don't want to, you know, being honest to say I don't want to um, take away from what you're saying or take away from your ability to say it by yourself. But let's say you know we're out with friends and I want to be able to help because they aren't understanding you. What would you like me to do? So you can speak to specific scenarios that you think are challenging or might be challenging and plan ahead, come up with a plan together with your partner. So things like thumbs up or down, just a little thumbs up or down. Yep, got it. Nope, didn't get that one. Um, a nod, of course, and those are all good active listening strategies as well. These these are good for anybody to do. Um, Fun code words, so you might come up with something silly if, if you have a certain sense of humor with them and, and or a certain thing that might be your way to you know confirm that you got it. I know my husband, he used to be in policing and he um, he would say affirmative, I think, or Roger, <laughs> something along those lines to, to uh, as a joke to sort of say, yep, got it. You know, So you can kind of have some fun with confirming that you got the message. And again, that's that positive, encouraging reinforcement for them when there are a lot of perhaps situations when they're not being understood. You want to also let them know when you do understand. Just a smile even. Uh-huh. Okay. Got it. You know, those sorts of little um, uh, confirmations can be helpful. So this is for, again, the early stages of Parkinson's. To continue with that, we also, in the early stages, earlier stages, when things perhaps aren't as significant as far as communication um, changes, you also want to make sure that you maintain um, and model a normal level of voice volume. We know, as I said before, that due to the different changes going on in the brain, voice, the volume of voice, so quiet and soft, can be impacted. And so you want to make sure that you model that, but not shouting. And so we don't want to shout, as, shout at them as if they cannot hear, because that can be frustrating for some people. But the idea that you do want to maintain a normal level of voice volume, again, you're keeping in mind the background noise, the environment that you're in, um, but not needing to shout. If anything, what I do encourage people to do is just over articulate your, your mouth more, open your mouth more and move, because again, we listen with their eyes. If they seem to not be quite getting what you're saying based on what's happening, but again, you're also trying to model speaking at a good volume. 
providing emotional support. Um, I know that there are lots of resources, I'm sure, through the Parkinson Society, but that idea of, you know, communication, as I said earlier, is such a, such a, a significant and critical part of our well-being, but again, it goes so overlooked. And when there is a challenge with communication, it can impact so many things, whether that being able to, you know, whether that's being able to work, being able to socialize or relate to people or take, pick up the phone or make those phone calls, ask those questions when you're out and about, those sorts of things. And so it can be something that requires some emotional support. And so identifying that perhaps as if there's a sore point and they seem, something seems off, that might be the thing, you know, so just making sure that that's something you're checking in on and getting support professionally if needed. Using specific feedback. So this is a this is a very practical example um, or tip. But the idea that when we don't understand, so we're doing all of these things, we made sure the environment's right, we're giving them our attention, we've established the context. And so let's say I've misunderstood. As I said, you you signal that, you indicate, okay, I didn't get that, or thumbs down. A really helpful strategy that that lends itself to a little bit more efficiency. So it's a little bit more efficient is this. And so let's say, for example, that you and your partner are talking about some friends. Your partner starts saying to you, Patty and Carlos are coming over on Monday for blah, 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 blah. And so the, the last part of that was muffled, whether that be that you weren't maintaining eye contact or they turned away or they moved out of the room while they were talking, or it was just imprecise, that, that, that unclear speech that I spoke about earlier. So there was something that was missed there. I caught that Patty and Carlo, Carlos are coming over on Monday, but I missed the rest of it. it, is what you're thinking to yourself. So rather than saying to them, what did you say? I didn't catch that. What you do is you give specific feedback. You actually restate, you repeat the part that you did catch. Patty and Carlos are coming over on Monday for, and then that allows the person with Parkinson's to know, A, you understood something, which is you know encouraging, and B, all I need to do is fill in the blank rather than repeat the whole thing over, which leads to more frustration and takes longer. So if I say something as a person with Parkinson's, they say something, half of it's clear, half of it's unclear. You as their care partner, their, their caregiver, repeat back the part that was clear, leaving a pause for them to fill in the rest. And again, you're maintaining eye contact here. You might have, a, you know, just soften your facial expressions. You don't want to be doing these things impatiently or out of frustration because that doesn't help. Um, but again, this is a very nice way to get to get um, clarification when there's a misunderstanding, and it's efficient as well. Ignoring errors um, if you understand the message. What this is really saying is that at the end of the day, communication is about connecting. It's not about correcting. And we hear this strategy in so many different ways when we work with different adults with different um, difficulties communicating. But so often, as the care partners, you may um, think to yourself or feel to yourself, I need to make sure they're doing it correctly. I don't, you know, and, and that might be coming out of a certain place of just love or out of concern. You don't want them to get away with saying things incorrectly as far as the disease process goes, making sure that they are speaking clearly. Depends on your personality style and your relationship, of course, too. But if you do find that there's a lot of frustration, it might be that there's an overcorrection happening for some people, especially I might say for wives who want to help their husbands be clearly so they may be speaking to them and it can lead to that frustration and withdrawal, which we don't want. And so ignoring the errors, is it really important? Is it really crucial that I get them to say every sound or every word clearly? He definitely mumbled, but I got the message. So the message is different than the words. Again, if we go back to the idea of Patty and Carlos are coming over Monday for dinner and, and your partner with um, Parkinson's had said some other detail that's that they, you know, as far as an aside or an extra thought about it or an extra opinion about it, which ultimately would be nice to know. But based on the situation, if you feel like, you know what, right now it's just important that I got the main message that they are coming over on Monday. I don't need to worry about the extra stuff that I think was was irrelevant. You have to make that judgment call and use your discretion in those situations. But of course, there are um, there are there is importance to this to say that it's okay to ignore things and to not always be correcting if the speech or the voice is incorrect. An additional communication strategy. So this is a nice tip. This is actually something that we do with um, speech pathologists. Myself, we we train and we practice and we work on different strategies and sessions to actually try and maintain speech and voice 
so that they're you're kind of staying ahead and delaying the progress the progression of those things so by working with um a therapist this is an example that we may do in in sessions so the idea here is sos it's a nice short and simple way to encourage your um, partner with parkinson's to um, speak in such a way that is better for them it's it's making sure they're using all of the muscles and all and making all of their sounds clearly again this is more for if there's imprecision if it's if it's um, not clear their rate of speech might be too fast things like that you have this strategy you might share this with them after the webinar today or you might just keep it in the back of your mind and model it as you were talking Basically, as it says here, so you're going slow, so slow being say, uh, slow rate of speech. So I'm slowing down my rate now. One word, over articulate open mouth. So all of those can stand for the O letter. So the idea that you want to do things and say things as if each, each syllable and each word is really important. And as the last one there says, say each sound, especially those ending sounds. What I find is a lot of people might mumble or soften their D's or their T's or their K's at the end of words and usually those are the sounds that make you know make a difference in the word that we're saying if I said um, wrote versus row and it was a really you know soft T I don't know what the word is that you said and it doesn't quite make sense but if I can make sure that I really emphasize those final sounds of, of words and so this is something that you as the communication partners the caregivers and care partners can actually model for yourself so when you are talking with speaking with the person who has parkinson's you can actually be sure that you are slowing down and again as i said earlier you're keeping a good voice volume um, so you're slowing down yourself you're over articulating opening up your mouth some more making sure that you have that eye contact that you are face to face saying each sound and what that sometimes does is we, we tend to mirror each other when we're communicating and so if you are talking to someone who's a fast talker you might speed up and so watching your own rate of speech with this person with 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 your person with your partner um, and modeling intentionally modeling and planning ahead and it might be that you just practice it and say you know at dinner time i'm going to do x y and z i'm going to um when we're talking i'm going to think about these things i'm going to choose one strategy and this might be the one that you try and model and as you become successful and build that habit in your in your communication um, exchanges you may add other strategies, but this is a great practical one as well for you to model or for to encourage them to do. Also recognizing that sometimes we need short, simple sentences out of necessity. And so this is talking about, you know, encouraging these clear, clear articulation, but I, I want to speak to the idea of it being short and simple, simply to say that sometimes if we have these long run on thoughts and long run on sentences, whether we, we as the partners or um, the person with Parkinson's, then we're losing a lot of information but if we keep things short and simple it's pretty intuitive to say that it's easier to understand and you may choose to do these things or encourage them to speak you know in shorter sentences if you know that they're more tired and again this depends on your relationship with them and their needs um, but if you know that they're more tired or for sure the, the off times between medication doses if you find that there are lots of sort of changes in the off times where things need to be adjusted, medication perhaps needs to be explored and, and managed differently, certainly that's important to help with the overall speech and communication aspects that, are, that we're working with. But that idea that you want to manage those basics, medications, et cetera, but recognize, okay, perhaps morning, we're good. We can converse and go as much as we need. But if it's the afternoon when they're usually tired or the evening, let's keep it short and sweet. Okay, honey, tell me about X, Y, and Z, but let's keep it short and sweet. I know that'll be easier for you. So just monitoring, you know, one thought per sentence versus rambling on and on um, is a good way to model that or encourage that to, to help with communication. Reducing frustration at the end of the day, encouraging um, satisfaction in those communication exchanges are, is the goal here. Encouraging, as I said, the person with Parkinson's, very specific encouragement is sometimes needed. Understanding and empathizing that, the, that you recognize they may feel frustrated, but you know, let's come back to this at a, at a later time. For late stages of Parkinson's disease, so the idea that you know some of those strategies may be helpful, um, and let me just see here, there we go. Um, so some of these strategies may be continue to be helpful, but you may need to adjust or increase the strategies or change them. So as I said earlier, you know, asking, asking questions with the choices included in the question is sometimes an easier way to get the information. 
Um, in this case, if it's a later stage, you may just want to ask a yes or no question. Do you want juice? No. Do you want coffee? Yes. Okay. Um, and so just limiting it so that all they have to do is say yes or no. And this is really much dependent on the person and the extent of, of the disease um, that you're working with. But certainly those types of questions can help with getting needs met or getting information um, to and from. Being open to new methods of communication, as I mentioned earlier in this, the basics tips slide about, you know, sort of things you might need to have, recognizing, you know, if we need to write something down, and especially in the later stages, if we need to be pointing at things, those sorts of tools are still communication and they are still important because again, at the end of the day, it's about the message, not necessarily the words that are said, but the message. Did I understand their overall feeling that they're trying to convey or their concern or their opinion about it? And so things like a communication board or a communication book that might include pictures of common places or common people, um, photos of common things that they may need to be requesting. And these may be helpful if you have additional caregivers coming in. And again, depending on the extent of the communication issues um, that are present. And then of course, Maintaining respect and, and encouraging their efforts is always important. Again, empathizing, recognizing that there is frustration there even in the later stages is important. Planning ahead, as I said, to have extra extra time in those cases when you know that things might take longer and more repetitions are needed. And, and again, often we rush in, we just think, oh, I need to ask about this or go over this. But planning ahead to choose that at the best time of day when you know you have the most time available. So this is the um, really neat summary and, and, and it's, it touches on some of the points that I just covered. Um, and this is a nice, quick and easy way to think, okay, how can I um, encourage and help with communication and, and as far as controlling the environment and controlling things that I do and encouraging them. So this speech acronym, and of course I can share this with you or, or the Parkinson Society, we can get this information to you. Um, the speech acronym covers some of what we just discussed in a really nice, succinct way. So S, of course, spotlight your face. So as it explains below here, keeping it visible, using good visual cues, keeping a good distance, all of those things, the so spotlight on your face, right, which goes into the eye contact piece that we talked about, making sure you're face to face in the same room, you've, you've um, thought about the distance, are we walking away while we're talking, are we staying face to face? P, so pausing between sentences. This is um, especially important for us ladies who perhaps like to, to chat and we have lots of things that we want to get off uh, our mind or we need to go over. And so recognizing, as I said earlier, that we also need to model that clear, simple speech and let you know our partner know that that's okay. But it also allows them to get a, a word in edgewise too. And so not rambling, using that clear speech pausing slightly allows them to also time to catch up on what you're saying. Because if, if we recognize that there are some cognitive changes that may be impacting, we definitely want to keep them in the conversation. And if I'm talking too fast or too much, how much of it are they actually able to A, understand and process if, if memory or processing is a little bit slower, depending on the stage and in different situations. So are they able to remember and process all of what I just said? to formulate to, to come up with their answer because if they're not answering me right away or they're not responding and it's 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 taking a long time for them to respond or it's not quite a you know the response doesn't quite make sense is it them or was it that i said too much for them and so there are so many benefits to pausing on purpose and and um, letting them process and catch up empathizing and being patient as i said earlier so again this is a nice acronym to summarize that ease their listening, as I said earlier, getting their attention, generally just trying to be helpful versus feeling like, you know, this is frustrating, just the idea that you are helping someone who's having a hard time here um, in certain situations. And asking for ways, as I said, to, to increase understanding. So that's the idea of easing the listening. Controlling the circumstances, as we talked about already, so noise, et cetera, lighting. Having a plan. And so as I touched on, the idea here is that you don't want to try and do all of these things at once pick something specific and say, okay, this week or today at dinner, I'm going to think about this. Or next time we have to talk about this big topic, I'm going to use these two strategies. The basics, as I touched on, are noise and lighting and distance. Those are things you should always be thinking about. But as far as the other strategies of, you know, slowing down, simpler sentences, maintaining your volume, 
using specific feedback, et cetera, have a plan to say, okay, if there's a breakdown, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do if, if I understood what they're saying and keep him encouraged so that he'll keep talking or she'll keep talking. So that as a summary is, is it for the presentation today. I know that you know, there may be some questions or comments that you may um, want to share. So I'll hand it over now. All right, thank you, Carrie. I'm just, sorry folks, just pulling up my technical side here now. Uh, I want to do what I, there we go. So I do have, we do have a couple questions that were submitted before um, the event started. And people are welcome to submit questions um, on the, on the, either the chat board or the question board as well. Uh, but the first, I guess the first question, and, and you may have answered it to a, an extent, but um, what's the greatest source of frustration that you see for either the Parkinson's patient or the care partner um, around the the communication side of the disease? And then consequently, what's the, the most common, or I, I don't want to say easiest, but, but um, most commonly used treatment? Sure. So the one common common um, source of frustration for both sides is the volume issue. So the idea that uh, the individual with Parkinson's is often not heard and has to repeat themselves, which can be frustrating for anybody. And then the care partner or the partner is often having to ask for that repetition or often misunderstanding what they're saying and needing and you know so there's some frustration on that end too so that's a very common um, source of frustration that I've come across and so the main way to address that or to treat that we in therapy and, and with the speech therapist we would work on volume breath so um, how well they're breathing how deep are they breathing encouraging proper breath as I said and when I say proper breath, I mean diaphragmatic breath. If everyone were to take a big breath right now, we probably would all raise our chest up. Our chest would go up and our tummy would pull in and we think we're taking a nice big breath. And that's called clavicular or shallow breathing, i.e. it's not really deep into our lungs. So encouraging and, and um, teaching proper diaphragmatic breathing, really deep breathing to really fill up that gas tank with air so that we can power our voice. And subsequently we, we can power our speech because as much as the voice is an issue, sometimes that mumbled or unclear, imprecise articulation, imprecise speech can also be an issue. But if we can affect um, change and improve the volume, sometimes the speech follows because you're just adding a little bit more power and precision to what they're saying. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the other question that we, that we had come through, uh, we are at, um, a computer society or a technical society. So are there any apps or tools I can download to help my partner communicate better? Oh, good question. Um, and so, sorry, was there more detail to that? That was it, eh, as far as there needs No, that was it. <laughs> okay, so there is one that I know of. I can just look it up here. I think it was called, I think it's called um, Loud and Clear, actually, funny enough, which I, <laughs> when we came up with the name for the group, I didn't, we didn't see this app or I didn't see this app. Um, but certainly loud and clear as far as um, the idea that there are ways to give yourself some feedback one as far as the app goes and I think that's what it's called loud and clear I'd have to look that one up mark but um, okay. one thing that I do encourage people highly encourage people to do is to record themselves and listen to themselves and so whether that's using your mobile device and um, you know let's say you're reading there's a or over dinner we're going to record the conversation and just record it, just give it, you know, five or 10 minutes or during reading, if you're reading something aloud and just listen after the fact. And sometimes again, there, because of there's this mismatch in perception, sometimes the person with Parkinson's needs to hear themselves um, and realize, oh, wow. Yeah, I wasn't very loud there. That wasn't, that wasn't loud enough. Um, and so what can I do to improve that? And that's where we think about taking a big, nice big breath before we speak, keeping shorter sentences, saying all of our sounds, um, and, and often in therapy, we, we encourage think loud and it's taken from, you know, a loud, um, the loud um, protocol, but it's sort of across the board where we're idea, the idea here is to just think louder. So basically anything with your mobile device, device where you can um, record it, whether that be by video or mobile, 
and if they're okay with this, um, to then listen to themselves after for that for, for them to get some better feedback on how they're doing. Great. And we did have a question actually by email. Mm -hmm. um, Brian asked, I've heard that whispering is something I shouldn't do. What do you think about this? <laughs> I um, I would agree. And so, um, and, and not having met this individual to actually hear what's going on with his voice, it's, I don't want to, um, so obviously not knowing all the details, I'm going to just give a general answer here because it may be very specific to his issue. But generally speaking, we discourage whispering. And the reason for that is that it can actually, if over, if done over time and done as like a hab habit, um, habitually as a, as a regular habit to speaking, if it's done that way, it can actually cause damage or, or um, it can hurt your voice. Whispering, it sort of seems opposite to what you'd think, but whispering requires that your vocal folds, which should be able to flow kind of like a swing goes back and forth. Your vocal folds need to vibrate back and forth and touch each other. Whispering is essentially holding that swing up or holding it back. And, the, and so you're not vibrating, which is why it's a whisper. Your voice isn't actually vibrating. If you put your hands on your throat, if I did that right now, I would feel a vibration. If I whisper, I wouldn't feel any vibration. And so um, whispering can cause damage just because of if it's prolonged, it can, it can sort of um, hurt the voice. So I would agree with that, but not knowing what their voice is doing. Otherwise, it's hard to speak to it further. Okay, great. And, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put you on the spot a little, Carrie, here okay. and give you a chance to do a bit of a, a, a advertisement for the Louder Clearer program, oh, okay. which we're working with you on. So maybe if you can just let everybody know what it's about and uh, how they can join. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So the Louder Clearer is a eight-week uh, training group for people with Parkinson's. And essentially, uh, you know, pre-COVID, it was supposed to be in person and, of course, now virtual. Um, and so essentially what it is, is it's doing some basic training and education. So it's not therapy because it's a group setting and we aren't really assessing everybody. It's not therapy per se. Essentially, it's education around your voice, around how we produce our voice, what um, other changes, you know, are perhaps involved that, that speech, pathologists can, speech pathologists can help with how to address those things um, and so that at the end of it by the eight weeks you have some concepts around how I can be louder and clearer again speaking about breath you know saying all those sounds and practicing it getting feedback um, those sorts of things to essentially be louder in your daily conversations we give some functional you know practice as far as phrases or sentences that you want to practice every day and then um, clearer as in your articulation so again that precision in the sounds which some people they find that they're mumbling or having to repeat themselves often um, would benefit from so it's eight weeks it's in a small group um, led by a speech pathologist such as myself there are other ones being run now which is really great the parkinson society is supporting that so um yeah it's a lot of fun we try and have some fun with it and make it really practical talking about you know let's say you're going to the airport and it's really noisy how would we ask and practice these things how would we ask these questions or going to the restaurant so making it really practical and educative, educational. Wonderful. And and for anyone in listening, you um, you can get more information and sign up for the program through our website, which is parkinsonsociety.ca. Um, before I thank you, Carrie, I do have some some public service announcements for everybody out there. So just as a reminder, uh, our 2020 virtual regional conference is being held on Saturday, October 17th. Uh, we have some phenomenal speakers joining us including um, Dr. Jog, uh, Quincy Almeida from the, the Movement Disorders Clinic, um, and Dr. Um, Roseman, Patricia Rose, Rosebush, sorry, who is a geriatric psychiatrist. So really interesting topics. Uh, all of these, these that I'm going to talk about can be found on the parkinsonsociety.ca website. Online support groups are continuing and uh, ramping up again. So uh, make sure you contact your, your local area um, for your date and time and code. For those who enjoyed the coffee clatch, um, we're starting that up again. It was a great, great uh, interactive piece and it will be starting up on Mondays starting next week. So if you wanna contact Lisa, that's your person, your point person, and she will give you the communication um, or the contact information of how to join it. And then a quick thank you to our local community foundations and United Ways um, for their support because they actually help us with this webinar series through the Emergency Community Support uh, Grants. 
which were recently issued through the government. So we do want to thank them as well. Carrie, I I learned so much. I just I wrote stuff down. I loved your necking up um, yeah. phrase. <laughs> that was just great. And also that that the communication partner, because we often think, you know, it's just about the care. Mm -hmm. And there's so much communication that can go back and forth. You're right. It, it just, you know, um, it, it's such a positive piece within the 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 Parkinson's disease. Yes, the person, you know, maybe maybe having difficulty with speech, but people like you give us so much hope and so much opportunity to figure out ways that we can we can um, keep that communication going and keep it keep it um, solid and 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 transactional. You know, it right. really helps our, our our patients and our clients. So on on behalf of all of us from Parkinson's Society Southwestern Ontario. I want to thank you for your partnership with us, uh, for your time today, and for your expertise in, in helping out our clients and, and their partners uh, move forward. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Mark, for the opportunity and for your assistance. And, and just on one final note, I do want to, um, Mark, if you would like, there was someone who asked about the technology or the app. So I'd be happy to share some more resources if, if you want to connect them with me um, to uh, just have a couple other ideas here as far as um, apps if they're interested in technology. Yeah, absolutely. The best the best way for us to do that, Carrie, is actually through Lisa. Okay. Um, so our, through our referrals, which would be great. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to, to contact us and we'll we'll refer you over to Carrie and, uh, and get some help. There you go. Excellent. Thank, thank you, you so thank much, you, everyone. everyone. Have a wonderful yeah. week. You too. And stay healthy. Yes, you too. Take care, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. That'll con that'll conclude today's um, webinar. Thank you, everyone, for participating, and we look forward to seeing you at our next one.